Hey folks, welcome to the AABIP podcast. This is Samir Avasarala from Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine in Cleveland, Ohio. I'm your host for this episode. Thank you for joining us today. Today we'll discuss how TNM9 affects our work as interventional pulmonologists. I'm thrilled to have Dr. Diana Yu join us. Diana is the director of UCSF's IP fellowship and associate professor of clinical medicine at UCSF. Diana, do you have any relevant conflicts of interest to disclose? Uh, nothing to disclose. Perfect. As a reminder, the views expressed on this podcast of those of the speaker in mind and not necessarily endorsed with, by the AABIP. With the, infor- with the formalities done, let's get started. As interventional pulmonologists, lung cancer diagnosis, staging, and treatment are the core of our practice. Yeah, some may even argue no lung cancer, no IP. Today, we're diving into the brand new TNM9 edition for lung cancer, which went live in January 2025, replacing the eighth edition that has guided us since 2018. Yeah, I would say the way we acquire tissue for diagnosis and staging plays a vital role in patient care and is heavily weighted during tumor board discussions. TNM9 has changed my practice, and today we have an expert to help us unpack these changes. Diana, what are the most significant changes from TNM 8 to 9 that affect us as interventional pulmonologists? So that's a great question. So um, as you mentioned, the ninth edition classification of lung cancer, it's been formally adopted since January. (laughs) Um, And some of the key features includes that it validated some of the significant changes in the T component introduced in the eighth edition. And then it further subdivided the N2 um, into N2A and 2B, and also subdivided M1C, uh, the the metastatic staging into single and multi-organ systems. Mm -hmm. Um, And that really has a huge impact on how we stage groups 2A, 2B, 3A, and 3B. Yeah, I I couldn't agree with you more. And I'm glad you brought up the N2A, N2B. My assumption is you use rows for all your cases. Is that correct? Or we do for most of our cases. I think I do think that sometimes it slows us down. <laughs> sure. So, um, exception of those cases for most staging, yes, we have rows. So this is where I found things got interesting. Are, are you switching new needles if you get a positive call on uh, the the first N two node you sample? So I think you know I I kind of wanted to emphasize um, and highlight here. A, Aside from changing needles for every single N2 node that we can biopsy, I think the highlight here is that the ninth edition really focuses on the need for thorough clinical assessment and pre-op and intra-op nodal evaluations. So, you know, when they looked at the database of, you know, I think they took out uh, uh, 70 plus thousand patients from the database, but in the 80,000 patient database that they looked at, it really it really wasn't sufficient to assess which imaging modalities or biopsy techniques were used. Sure. Um, but it's consistent that there's significant survival difference uh, seen in a large global database, right, which provides somewhat of a real life applicability. So I do think it's important to look at it. But I think rather than focusing on how do I sample every single ipsilateral mediastinal nodes, which include a lot of things, right, two, four, seven, and sometimes even eight and nine, are we going to biopsy all of these and switch needles for every single node? I think we need to do a better job at assessing imaging. So, you know, do we look at PET-CT a little bit more carefully to look for FDG uptake nodes? and study them before we actually go into doing EBUS and looking at every single mediastinal node. Um, Really, because we can't logistically reach every single node and biopsy everything, right? So we may have to rely on some of the clinical and pathologic diagnosis for accurate staging rather than to say, "Do do I switch needles for everything? Obviously, if I did see more than one ipsilateral mediastinal nodes, um, I typically, you know, on the same side, I typically consider switching it if it's far apart. So if I see clusters of seven lymph nodes or four R lymph nodes that were positive on PET, I won't necessarily change my needles with the high probability of going in that they're positive. But if I'm going reaching up to a two R, let's say from a four R, uh-huh. that gives me that gives me a reason to maybe switch needles. So, you know, I think that's some of the things I wanted to highlight here. It's not just, do we need to get 10 needles for 10 lymph node biopsies? 
That makes perfect sense. So I'm glad you brought up uh, pre-procedure imaging, including PET scan. Uh, what I've gathered from colleagues across the country, the availability of PET scans before you do, do bronchoscopy are, are hit or miss. And I've been surprised in my own practice that a lot of folks have PET scans already done, which may not be the case across the country where unless a diagnosis of cancer is confirmed, there is trouble getting a, a PET scan done. Uh, what's uh, what's the, the most prevalent pattern at your shop? Yeah, I think for the most part, we have, we've been fortunate to get some of the PET CTs up front uh, ahead, ahead of time. So we get it for different reasons, right? We get it for sometimes referrals that get sent to our thoracic colleagues for resection, yet they got staging PET CT that shows some nodal avidity that requires further evaluation before resection. So when it's when it's cases like that, that's a little bit more straightforward. Obviously, go for the ones that are PET avid. That's going to really change. It's like a at stage defining nodes, I make sure that I biopsy all of them. But I can't really say that I have adapted to biopsying every single lymph node um, and changing needles. I don't really know about your practice, but um, I kind of see it as a... And also, we can't really get to every single node, right? Some of these nodes are obtained surgically. So after you do an actual pathologic diagnosis with surgical specimen, it gives you a bigger picture of complete staging. So, you know, I don't think we necessarily have to feel the need to biopsy every single lymph node that we can get our hands on. I think it, I think overall it it captures uh, radiographic or bronchoscopic as well as invasive uh, biopsies combined together as a whole gives you a complete picture of the staging of the patient rather than, I think, focusing on, you know, do I biopsy three, uh, four R's that are clustered together versus um, looking at a whole picture and taking a step back. Sure. Let's, with an example that let's say a patient had a PET CT that, that's done, um, with contralateral N3s, let's say it's PET negative, that means no activity and then no, no nodal enlargement. Uh, I'm curious, do you, do you look at the contralateral hilum or you, you just start with the contralateral metastinum and work towards the lesion? That's a great question. I think that we know based on literature that there are such thing as a, uh, nodes that are actually positive on pathologic sampling and surgical sampling uh, that are not pet avid, right? So mm -hmm. we, so I, I actually do very strategic N3 and two and one, and I go in that order um, with the needle uh, every time, even if the pet didn't show contralateral hyalur adenopathy. If I see more than a few millimeters, I do stick a needle in. I think that it's a very minimal process and less risk to the patient. Um, at the same time, performing a thorough evaluation. And also for the ipsilateral uh, lymph adenopathy, I mean, lymph nodes, even if we biopsy it, surgeons typically go back and resect those sure. you know, at the time of resection. And, and that has also shown some discordance, you know, albeit it's a very small percentage. We do see that sometimes they see it in a surgical specimen that they didn't see it on even an EBUS, even though it's a very small percentage. So I do think that you have to be very methodical in going from N3 to 1 um, and, uh, uh, and performing uh, staging that way consistently. Absolutely. I'm going to shift gears here just a little bit and uh, come up with a situation where you don't have a PET CT scan. Uh, you you looked at um, nodes, at, uh, several N2 nodes look suspicious on EBIS. They were, of course, enlarged on CT scan. Do you have a specific strategy, uh, such as starting with the least suspicious one first to you know, maybe not switch so many needles, or do you just go in a particular order every single time? I think that's case case by case. I wish I can say that you start from higher up. So let's say you have a 4R. I think there are different components to this, right? So sometimes even if N2 node, the first biopsy you do is positive. I mean, if you get a positive node on the first sample and you have another uh, isolated node, let's say 4R and a 7, they're both N2 nodes, they're positive, that is still considered multinodal positivity in two t uh, uh, N2 B. Sure. So does it necessarily require that you biopsy every single node, including that 2R? You may, you know, question that. Um, and I think when it comes to those unique cases, you have to think about, okay, is this patient a potential radiation treatment candidate? And is this going to change my radiation field? And sometimes I, you know, I I, I get more tissue sampling just to also 
um, gain some perspective for our radiation oncologists to say, hey, what, what will be our field of treatment? And I think that also makes a difference. Like having a 2R positive versus, you know, cluster of 4R and a 7, that makes a difference in how we treat, right? Um, so I think that I also have that in mind when I uh, biopsy lymph nodes. So if I do see a positive and I do see a um, a, a separate uh, node that's um, and the question for you is if it's negative on the first pass or positive on the first pass, do I switch needles to ensure that the following biopsy is not contaminated, right? So if I have a pr- high probability that let's say four hours positive and my uh-huh. probability that the seven is going to be positive because it's hot on pet, or you say you, there's no pet. <laughs> if Th- this one, on there's pet, no pet. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> there's no pet, but there's enlargement that's a, that looks suspicious. Then I wouldn't mind using the same needle. But if it's, if it's obviously smaller node that I would still sample that looks less suspicious on ultrasound and on imaging, then I would switch the needles. Interesting. I, I I do something very very similar, uh, and I think uh, the the more iterations of a uh, TNM that come out, and also uh, the newer treatment modalities, uh, neoadjuvant, et cetera, et cetera. I, I truly believe that the lines are starting to get blurred about which patients are truly surgical candidates and which aren't. It, it used to be much more clear. No, definitely. I think um, you know. I think we as interventionalists not. I think sometimes we get so caught up in, you know, which node, which tissue, which size needle. I think we get so caught up on these factors, but I do think that um, we have to really, you know, perform a more holistic, comprehensive, thorough clinical assessment, right? So, you know, as I alluded to, pathologic assessment is not just whether it be bronchoscopic or surgical, you know, together you would provided more accurate nodal staging. Like we would start with, okay, well, that was negative. They they resucked. And even the prevascular nodes, sometimes for the surgeon, sometimes they, it turns out positive or even periaortic lymph nodes that we can't access turn out positive. Uh-huh. But when, when you do surgical resection and get a PET and there's convincing radiographic evidence, even though you've not tissue um, accurately obtained tissue for histologic diagnosis, we would still take that into consideration in the nodal staging, right? And also the comprehensive staging staging as a whole to prognosticate because, you know, I, I mean, what's surprising is if you look at sort of the the five-year uh, survival between 2A and 2B, I mean, it's, it's about 10% difference in that small nodal group change, right? So, and that is even after adjusting for variables like age, sex, histologic type, you know, history, history of prior cancers, you know, and, and resection completeness. There's a lot of there's a huge difference. I mean, I'm su- surprised to find that there is such a significant difference in prognostication and, you know, s- survivability of our patients. So I, I do think looking at a whole as a whole, rather than just looking at separate nodes, um, that would be more beneficial and useful for our patients um, as we treat and move forward, right? Because there's also other factors like their tumor-specific, tumor-related factors, right? And there's a lot of factors that we're not really taking into consideration at the time. Even with the TNM9, there could be additional factors that can uh, further um, enhance how we treat patients based on, and these are not included in the TNM, right? This is purely anatomical. Right. So there are tumor related things and patient and treatment related factors that really will further add to the prognostication, which, you know, which hopefully we do more research, ongoing research. This is sort of an incentive for us to actually focus more on those things to further increase our, um, how we manage our patients. Yeah, I think that perfectly underscores how important uh, what we do, uh, clinical assessment, radiological assessment, and then also bronchoscopic assessment uh, to uh, these patients kind of lung cancer pathway. So uh, the next question I have is what thoughts do you have on what places that don't use ROSE? How should they handle the TNM9? (laughs) I think that also goes into... um, you know, what we just discussed about, I think that, you know, perhaps institutions that don't have rows, there should be more emphasis on obtaining maybe more, uh, more of a PET CT up, up front, or even getting more modalities, uh, imaging modalities to give you a little bit of a better understanding before you go into um, 
a nodal staging, right? There's there's definitely risk of contamination. You know, there's a lot of risks that we, you know, it's it's amazing how we just ignore a lot of these things when we go and do EBUS just blindly. You know, we can do this in our sleep at this point, so we don't think about these things. But I think maybe having a little bit of a clinical um, assessment even beforehand may be more critical in institutions that don't have rows. To really think think about these things ahead of time before before you go in and intubate a patient who may have a large two R that you bypass because right. instead of putting an LMA you put a ET tube and you bypass and you decide not to look and then you get a pet later and what do you know you have a two R that might be positive so I think maybe they have to be a little bit more methodical in getting a clinical picture before just jumping to EBUS. I've uh, I've lucked out every place I've uh, trained at work at Hasbro, so hopefully that that never changes. Um, yeah. With uh, with IP's expanding role, uh, what other tandem classification do you think we should keep on our mind? I ask this because you know from time to time I've been asked to do staging for esophageal cancer and, and had to review that. Are there other TNM classifications that you, you think we should spend a little bit more time getting just as good at as we are with lung cancer? I mean, you can say that we should be, we should know everything <laughs> NCCN <laughs> recommends, um, including, I mean, that that's a, that's a very open-ended question, I think, in general, just because, you know, we see a lot of metastatic disease processes, right? So sure. we look at a lot of other solid organ cancers that end up in the lung. And, you know, we see a lot of these GUGI, you know, XYZ. Do we need to know classifications for all of those? It'd be helpful to know, I think, for sure, to understand at least thoracic oncology, I think some of the thymic cancer, some of the tumors that don't re- we don't really deal with specifically, like the anterior mediastinal tumors that we don't really necessarily deal with, that our surgeons deal with more specifically, mesotheliomas, esophageal. So anything in the thorax, I think it's it's fair game for us to at least have some basic understanding and knowledge. I can can agree with you more. So, Diana, before we wrap up, is there anything else about TNM nine that you think we missed and you, you feel we should have covered? No, I think I really emphasized uh, repeatedly for us interventionalists not to focus on which node and how many needles, but to really um, perform a comprehensive assessment, and that is uh, that will make a huge difference um, uh, on our patients and their outcomes. Awesome. I appreciate your time. I know our listeners will do the same and I'm going to pencil you in for uh, the TNM 10 episode when we, when we record that. Uh, yeah. In, in 10, 10 years. To, 10 to 12 <laughs> years or so. Great. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Diana.